Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second uh, HMEI faculty seminar of the 2022-2023 season. This is our second seminar when we are back in full force. We have food, we have each other's company, we also have our friends uh, online, so it's a much larger community, and uh, it is also the, our in-person community. So this is, this is very exciting. Uh, I loved hearing the, the, the tones of everybody talking to each other that I had to tap to hush, and that's, that's what we want, right? So let's, let's keep that excitement going uh, when we get to the question and answer session. So today, uh, I'm very excited. We have Professor Agustin Fuentes from the Department of Anthropology, who is uh, going to join us uh, to discuss our relationship to our cousins. Um, and uh, like all family dramas, uh, they're uh, combinations, I'm sure, of comedy and tragedy. Um, and so uh, Agustin is, is uh, he, as far as I, I can tell, did all his uh, learning at UC Berkeley and uh, is now here, and we're very fortunate for that. And uh, he has, he studies a broad range of topics, but uh, including using uh, primates and evolution to help understand people and, and human culture. Uh, I saw the latest book listed on the website uh, was Why We Believe, um, sort of understanding the role of evolution in human, uh, what is it? Belief? Self? Yeah, self. Self or sure. something like that. And so I, I'm actually going to pull that up on, uh, and read it because it sounds very interesting. Uh, I will see, in addition to being a great scholar, has, uh, is also a, a public figure in science and has taken great effort to make the work that we do to expand our understanding, our connection, uh, with each other to, to reach people beyond the academia and has received a number of awards for this. So I think we're in for a treat. Not just great scholarship, but also uh, what is, what is uh, a good presentation. So, so I, I've said enough and too much. And so I was saying, please, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Vecchi, for the invitation. Uh, thanks to HMEI. Is this too loud to, no, is that good? OK. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come and share. Uh, it's a little loud. Hold on. Right here. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, OK. I'm still making a little bit of feedback. Any, oh, it's that. I'll try to stay away from that a little bit. Um, so thanks uh, for coming out. Um, that's a high bar to live up to, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, I'd like to just jump in and give this a whirl. So the planet is in the midst of a climatological and ecological crisis of monumental proportions, and humans are at the center of it. How human communities envision and enact their interfaces with other humans and other organisms matters for the future of this planet. But not all human communities do so, do any of these things in the same manner. Do you want to uh, yeah. fix that little yeah. feedback? Uh, how about just muting the program or turning that one down? How's that? A little bit better? Less feedback? OK, I'll stay over here. Anyways, where was I? <laughs> um, uh, not all human communities do this in the same manner. Unfortunately, many of the dominant approaches to these sort of contemporary crises, be they apocalyptic or technocratic, or even the contemporary conservationist, preservationist spectrum, are not showing the successes they promised or hoped for. I'd like to suggest that in addition to these perspectives that we undertake in the academy, we can also maybe add a degree of optimism, maybe even a little hope, by adopting an evolutionary, anthropologically rich biocultural view of human dynamics that incorporates a broader recognition of multi-species mutual equalities, decentering some of these traditional sort of academic, economic, and ecological approaches, and recentering others. In this lecture, I will offer you the lens of the other primate human relations and draw on biocultural, ethnographic, demographic, and ecological examples to argue that an integrative and transdisciplinary approach to the Anthropocene dynamic and the multiple catastrophes uh, that come with it is important, and that a multi-species and more inclusive praxis is not only necessary, 
but it is conceivable. All right? So there's great inequity in the Anthropocene, and there are many ways to push against it. What I'd like to do today, in the time remaining, is offer you a narrative in three parts. The first part is the sort of a framing that I would like to do an evolutionary context for what are we talking about in the Anthropocene. All of you know about the Anthropocene. You all probably fight about when it started, what it means, how it works. I'm not that interested in that. I'm interested in sort of thinking about the sort of human patterns that give rise to that, and especially the inequities amongst humans in the Anthropocenic context. Uh, then, very, very briefly, part two will be hopefully to convince you, maybe you already know this, of the multi-species reality of, of, of our existences, and then eventually um, to highlight why primates matter, and then spend the bulk of the talk on three vignettes, uh, ranging from, let's say, despair to maybe a little bit of hope, uh, that center on a primate-oriented vision, looking out at humans and what that might tell us about humans' inequity and possibilities. All right, so let's start with part one, uh, Anthrones, Anthropocene, and Human Inequity. So very, very briefly, um, this is human evolution. I don't have time to go into the last seven million years, but what I want to point out is that in the last two million years, our genus, the genus Homo, has evolved a particular distinctive niche, a new way of being in the world that involves extensive manipulation of extrasomatic materials, the working of the world, not just of the body, but the manipulation of the world around us and eventually other species. Um, this is quite old, it's not that new, but the way we tend to think about it in an Anthropocenic context is, of course, the last 15, 10,000 years of the advent of, advent of domestication, sort of recognizable large-scale manipulation. I would like to point out that this is actually much older. M recent work, both in uh, the uh, American tropics and in Southeast Asia, clearly demonstrates that it is 15, 20, 25,000 years of intensive ecosystem manipulation by humans that has resulted in the shaping of these ecological dynamics across multiple ecotypes and landscapes. So this whole idea that it's only this last terminal Holocene sort of big change that characterizes the uh, Anthropocene is incorrect, right? Um, I'd like to suggest that we could rather, I don't like this chart, it's overly simplistic, but it gives you an idea that really is over the last 20, 30, 40,000 years, it's the pace of change that's, that's sort of altered, rather than the capacity or the human niche that is radically altered. Given that, uh, I think we need to clearly, as uh, Earl Ellis tells us, um, we cannot really think about understanding global uh, ecological systems without thinking about the why and the how of the human niche construction. We are ecosystem engineers par excellence. That's what we do. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind when we talk about the Anthropocene. However, um, we model it in different ways. And I'm saying we here as the Academy. And we're going to come back to that. The Academy, uh, frequently a conservationist, uh, uh, um, the Academy and the sort of NGOs and governmental representatives like to do the sort of what I call the 10,000 year 2018 comparison. 10,000 years ago, this is sort of what the planet looked like in a sort of Lego model. Uh, to, you know, a couple years ago, this is what the planet looked like. This radical change in global representation of different kinds of ecosystems and ecologies. Now this system is okay, right? But we all know that it actually misrepresents the complexity and the dynamics of local and regional changes in this Anthropocenic context. So we can't just say forest percentage, because forests are different across different places, have different kinds of impacts. We can't just say pollutant production, uh, agriculture, or urbanization, because they all reflect different kinds of things. And herein lies, I think, the biggest challenge to our current, particularly academic engagement with the Anthropocene. Um, and that is, how do we represent it? How do we talk about it? I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Anthro Numbers, Anthropo Numbers uh, organization. They've done a really incredible, this is just a messy slide, but you can go look at anthroponumbers.org. They've done a very, very good job of trying to quantify right, uh, human impacts on climates, either by per human or per region, right? this sort of looking. One of the problems with this sort of technocratic approach to the Anthropocene in these crises is that it sort of looks at us as a species, we as a global, or me as an individual. Um, I'd like to suggest that there's a significant problem with the we and the us when we talk about the Anthropocene. All of you are familiar with this, so I'm not telling you anything new, but I think it's important if we try to readjust or expand the ways in which we think about the Anthropocene and the global uh, crises 
uh, that we are now facing. All right. You all know that not all humans contribute equally to the contemporary climactic and global and ecological crises, nor do they all respond in the same ways. Um, so I would like to suggest, and just to remind you, maybe we can use sort of planetary boundaries. I don't know if you like that framing or not, but if we look at the sort of planetary boundaries and we do it either by sort of a G20 or general higher or lower income or by nation, we find dramatic differences and inequalities in contribution to the overshoot and contribution to climactic crises in the Anthropocene, right? So there's dramatic inequity in which humans are producing the particular structures and processes that are manipulating environments in a particular way that are causing uh, climactic ecological changes at local, regional, and global levels. Um, we also find that there's radical inequities and differences in who is suffering, that is, which human populations. And here, just uh, colleagues, uh, Drew Marcantonio, Deborah Javelin, and I showed recently that just looking at um, both who is the higher um, risk for climate uh, change impact and who is dying and suffering uh, morbidity from toxic pollution, that those overlap heavily. Uh, and you will notice that they are largely in those areas that are not the major contributors right, to these climate processes. All of you know this, but it's important to remember it when we ask who's talking about the Anthropocene. Who gets to decide what we do in regards to these crises and how we model them and how we represent them and what the actions of individuals, whether we or groups of we or us, uh, do. I'd like to suggest to frame the rest of this conversation that there might be other ways to look at it rather than the traditional sort of technocratic, apocalyptic, or even the conservationist, preservationist spectrum. And here I would like to draw on uh, the work of uh, the geographer Kyle Powis White, um, who argues that in addition to these multiple other ways of the academy, there are particular, in this case, North American indigenous perspectives on ecosystem dynamics that focus primarily on the relations between humans and other plants and animals, as opposed to broad scale ecologies or these kinds of numeric technocratic representations that I've just given. And I would like to suggest that these relations, particularly between some humans and some other animals, are an important place to look. And I'm, this is nothing new. This is a major sort of set, uh, uh, scholarly engagement right now where you have a variety of different academics from indigenous scholars uh, to scholars in the social sciences and the biological sciences and conservation activists all pushing for a notion of recognition that multi-species dynamics, that is, the complex relations between some humans and some other animals, are an important frame for us to think with and about the kind of Anthropocene crises uh, that we are facing at the moment. All right, so I hope, this is stuff is not new to you, but hopefully this is framing it slightly, that we can't just talk about humans, we can't just talk about ecosystems, sometimes we might want to step back and think about relations. Um, and just uh, for a point, this is an incredible shot, uh, a photograph by Brieman Das a number of years ago, was runner up in a, in a um, National Geographic uh, uh, photo contest. This is one of the largest dumps in the world, right? Found in India and visible from space. Uh, and it is daily uh, visited by these large uh, carnivorous storks, cows, people, and a variety of other species interacting, living in this Anthropocenic moment. And I'd like to suggest that these kinds of relations might offer us a special insight into thinking anew, or at least expanding the way in which we engage these crises. Okay, number two. Um, I would like to, hopefully, I don't have to, but I would just like to remind everyone that humans are, in and of themselves, multi-species ecologies. Right? Never think of yourself as alone because you're not. Right? The mites on your eyelids will tell you you're not. Your microbiome will tell you you're not. All of the multitude of viral and other elements infusing everything from your genomic system to your physiology, to your intestinal system, to the entire uh, uh, contents of your saliva and mucosal membranes in your mouth will tell you you are not alone. And I think that's an important frame because even when humans or holobionts, as I like to uh, borrow from Lin Chu and Scott Gilbert, um, even when we give birth, we don't just replicate a human or produce a new human, we produce an entire new constellation ecological dynamic of multiple species. That's a, that's a little bit of a side, but I really want to drive home the point that we are always in multi-species dynamics, even at the individual level. But I'm not talking about the individual level. I'm really interested in the diverse array of interactions between humans, 
a particularly interesting mammal, and in this case, other mammals. I'm really interested in, in interspaces, interfaces in multi-species context between mammals. Um, and, and we know that humans have a, a wide variety of complex relationships globally with different mammals. Now, when we talk about the Anthropocene, we always go back to this domestication thing, and we keep wanting to talk about domestic animals, right? It's, well, it's humans who've taken other animals and reshaped them, the sort of human reshaping, damage, harm, structuring of the world. And I'd like to suggest, well, that's important. So, for example, right, humans and domestic animals make up the vast uh, bulk of mammalian biomass on the planet. That's not this talk, no, that's another talk, and I think it's a very important one, um, but that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about this multitudes of relationships between humans and other mammals and other species, other animals and plants, in and around our daily lives, even in the most anthropocenic of contexts, the city. Throughout urban environments, we see a multitude of species coexisting with humans in dynamic and complex ways, co-shaping and co-creating not just the local ecologies, but the local pathogen environments and a variety of other sort of ecological dynamics that are critical if we want to understand what the Anthropocene is and how we can model it and understand it. Um, even right here in Princeton, right? We know the, the Princeton fox, there are actually multiple of them, but uh, here's one of them. So having said all of that, I want to convince you that of all those mammals out there, of all those other animals, the primates are of particular note. Primates, like you and I, uh, are particularly important for a number of reasons. And so I'd like to take two seconds here to argue why they're important, and then spend the rest of the talk showing what I think is a relevant framing that the other primates can offer us to thinking about the Anthropocene. Uh, why are, are, are primates important? Well, we are primates, right, which is the sort of critical one. So if you think about humans as primates, then we have to recognize that the physiological and ecological niches occupied by humans, right, are, are right next to those of other apes, and particularly those of a wide variety of primates, including macaques, who we'll come back to. And so when we're modeling ecological and evolutionary dynamics, we need to think about what are those clades or those taxa that are in the same space as we are, and it turns out uh, primates are an important one. Um, this is not just for pathogen ecologies, but it's very importantly. Humans and non-human primates, particularly uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Americas, or uh, particularly Central and South America, and uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, share long histories, millennia, if not hundreds of millennia, of co-pathogen exchange and sharing and modifying one another's immune systems. And I think that's a very important reason to think about primates in this anthropocenic context. It also turns out that primates, on average, have very long life histories, right? very slow reproductive cycles, are fairly large bodied for mammals, and thus are really good indicators of ecosystem health, particularly forest health uh, um, and a variety of uh, other kind of ecotype health. Um, and they help us as a measure of impacts on different types of ecosystem structuring. And so they're important for that. And, and, and finally, uh, as, as many of you may know or may not know, um, primates and humans, when they overlap, that is other primates and humans, when they over, overlap, frequently infuse one another's cultural processes and ways of being. That is, many other primate species are central in the ways in which humans envision, perceive, and understand the world and the ways in which they act, both at sort of physical and ecological terms, but also in cosmological uh, perceptions and uh, behavior. All of those reasons then suggest that, hey, if we're interested in these contemporary global, regional, and local crises, it might be worth asking, well, maybe not just a focus on the human, but maybe a focus on other primates might help us not only understand about humans, but understand some of these ecosystem dynamics in a novel way. So humans and primates share a lot in common, other primates, that is, share a lot in common, and that, that makes them a good focus for this kind of engagement. But it's not all humans. It turns out that those very human populations that are at most at risk from the contemporary anthropocenic crises, ecological and global disasters, are the same populations that overlap most extensively with the other primates. So it is interesting to think that not all humans are experiencing the Anthropocene in the same way, and most primates are experiencing the Anthropocene in the exact same context as those humans who are suffering the most from it. So again, the primate eye lens might offer us maybe some insight. All right, so I'd like to then use the rest of my time before we discuss this to lay out three case studies uh, from work on primates that help us look to the human world, look to broader anthropocenic and ecological processes 
and maybe get a broader and deeper understanding on them. Um, but before I do so, I want to acknowledge uh, where an enormous amount of these, these data come from. Um, uh, I'm going to summarize years and years of data from hundreds of scholars, um, particularly the very uh, large multi-year project led by Alejandro Estrada and Paul Garber. It's resulted in a number of publications that involves 50 or 60 scholars and, and hundreds of collaborators across the entire planet, uh, and, and work by uh, Sindhu Radhakrishna, Ananda Sinha, uh, and my colleagues, uh, Kerry Dore, Aaron Riley, and a variety of other scholars. I'm going to summarize intensively, but in our discussion, if you would like references or a variety of those other things, please let me know, um, because this is the work of countless scholars uh, in collaboration with communities that produce the kind of information that I'm going to synthesize and summarize in a nutshell. OK, let's start with despair. We all know um, that, in fact, that, that, you know, it is a global S show uh, for much of the world. Um, the rapid scale of crises uh, across landscapes, ecotypes, and global geographies is enormous. Um, and this rapid uh, sort of cat catastrophic Anthropocenic process, series of processes has had a major impact on species other than humans. It's had a major impact on humans, but let, let's talk about other species. This is a 10-year-old sort of uh, infographic. All of these numbers are higher now, all right? So you, know, you can debate whether or not we're really in the midst of the sixth sort of uh, mass extinction, but it doesn't matter to all of those species going extinct at this very moment, whose numbers are increasing on a daily basis. Um, so it turns out that uh, uh, Alejandro Stara, Paul Garber, and about 40-something of uh, scholars, including myself, spent a number of years basically asking the question, how are primates doing? Uh, can we look around at all of the primate ranges, all the published data, and uh, interview a number of folks for unpublished data, and figure out, OK, we know the other primates are in trouble, but how bad is it? What's going on? And so we published these data initially in Science Advances in 2017. And I'll show you a little bit of graphics, but let me show you one graphic that summarizes all of the data. Please go to the paper if you want the actual data, which is quite extensive and horrendously depressing. Um, but here's what the, the summary graphic that was created for us uh, at the end of the day, after this many years of collecting the data. 60% of primates are threatened extinction, 75% are rapidly losing the populations, and 100% of the cause is this one primate. Now, to depress you further, this number is now 68%, this number is now 83%. This number has stayed the same. This is a very depressing picture. And it's even more depressing when you think it's across all regions, right? Uh, where primates live. And most importantly, if we, as we did, model sort of a continued, uh, not even a radically expanded, but a continued agricultural and habitat conversion process over the rest of this century, we go from a distribution of primate species like this in 2017 to a distribution of primate species like this uh, by 2100. As a radical reduction, probably over 65% of all living primate ranges and species. That's despair, right? This is very, very, very bad from the primates' perspective, right? Many of you may not care if all the primates go extinct, but they do, I guarantee you. What was really interesting for our, our analysis is that the rationale, the reasons behind this extinction crisis are almost identical to the reasons for the suffering of those human populations in these same geographic areas. In other words, the critical factors manipulating and impacting negatively other primate populations are the same as those factors that are critically and negatively impacting human populations in these same ecotypes and geospheres. Primates are of nothing if not visual, and so I just want to leave you with this first depressing narrative with an even more depressing image. These are six of, of the most amazing, beautiful primate taxa that will most, for, most likely be extinct in our lives, most certainly be extinct in the lives of our children. OK, so that's very depressing. Let's move on to something a little less depressing. I would like to suggest, and I will illustrate with two very brief sort of ethnographic ecological cases, um, that not all is lost. It turns out that just like I was saying, not all the Anthropocene is equitable or equally cast across the planet in human populations, the same is true for primate populations. There are certain primate populations that are not doing that bad, even in the midst of all of these crises. Let us take, for example, the long-tailed macaque, Macaca fascicularis. 
Um, and here I'm drawing heavily on the work of the Long Tail Macaque Project, uh, directed by uh, uh, Meline Friss Hansen, and uh, really cl in collaboration with over 60 scholars from 14 different countries around the range of the long tail macaques. It turns out that this is one of the most successful primate radiations, second only maybe to humans and rhesus macaques, a sister taxa of, of this one that is spread throughout South Asia and, and up into North. So what are the, what are, what's going on here? When you walk through Southeast Asia, what you see are humans and long tail macaques in coexistence, in conflict, but relating to each other over time for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. We have early evidence uh, from near cave in Borneo, at least at 28 to 35,000 years ago, of cohabitation of humans eating macaques, but also probably taking the infants as pets. We have this complex long-term relationship that of course revolves in conflicts, but throughout Southeast Asia, wherever you look in the rearview mirror, um, long-tailed macaques are there. So, a number of scholars, colleagues, including myself, have spent some time asking what is it about these long tail macaques and their perspectives that facilitate, in a time of all these extinctions and decreasing numbers in other primates, a reasonable level of success, right? And it turns out that uh, they're able to share our space and food. Um, they have a very interesting pathogen co uh, ecological landscape with us, um, and that they are quite adept at moving in and around human cultures and ecologies more so than almost any other primate. Um, so there's something about the vision, the perception, and the behavior, the ecosystem of long-tail macaques that allows them to coexist with humans, uh, particularly successfully, at least in certain areas. Let me give you two examples. The first is Bali, uh, Indonesia, where I and my colleagues from Universitas Udayana uh, spent many years uh, basically asking the question, why are there so many monkeys in Bali? Um, and it turns out that there are uh, Bali is a very interesting place for a number of reasons, um, but there's over 3 million humans, or almost 4 million now, and, and probably between 12 and 16,000 macaque monkeys, uh, which is actually quite uh, prominent in an island with incredibly high human densities, averaging about 482 kilometers square. Uh, but, but the areas, as I'll point out, where most of the monkeys live are about 800 to over 1,000 uh, humans per square kilometer. That's an incredible density of humans, and not one you expect a fairly large bodied mammal to coexist with. Um, the punchline is that there's a reason for this, and that reason is Balinese, Hinduism, and their temple agricultural complex systems. Um, you can look at the work at Stephen Lansing at ASU and a number of other colleagues uh, from Bali, the United States, and the UK, who've modeled these uh, dynamics and basically demonstrated how you get a landscape that is associated with Balinese Hindu traditions, the establishment of temple relationships around communities, the connections between communities, and the controlled movement of water through wet rice agriculture, which creates a particular fascinating ecosystem, right, that not only has incredibly high productivity in an agricultural sense for rice, but also, because of the temple system, maintains forest patches throughout this high-density agro religious cultural system. So what you get is an island that looks like this with the central part of the island with these 200 uh, uh, rivers moving through it and this incredible subak system. All the red is, is uh, this is the main city, but all the red is dense uh, urban, not urban or peri-urban or village areas. The yellow is rice agriculture. And here's all the forests, right? You see there's still some forest left in Bali. But if then you ask the question, where do the monkeys live? Uh, the monkeys all live here. That is, just to go back here, you can see all the monkeys live, none of them live out in the open forested area. They all live in these dense, incredibly dense human areas because the subak system, the temple system, and Balinese cultural traditions create an environment of safety around the temples. Uh, Balinese Hinduism predicts that these temples are, are uh, uh, creates a space in which these temples are protected areas and all animals living and trees living in these temples are protected. So these macaques do live in these temples. They are able to forage on those landscapes. The Balinese religious structures actually facilitate through the contribution of dietary nutrition to the macaques. Um, and the Balinese economy, especially with the advent of tourism, has been incredibly beneficial to the macaques, where macaque populations are actually increasing in Bali right now. Uh, a few of the major areas around tourist sites, the populations have increased by over 1,000%. Um, so we see an incredible dynamic that 
is not separate from the world. So I'm going to come back to hope, but a little despair. Um, the Indonesian economy impacts, of course, the Balinese economy, as does the global economy. And the COVID-19 pandemic has restructured the Balinese economy, which actually restructures some of these relations. But interestingly, much of this revision has been, or this movement back, has been towards more traditional agricultural systems, which reduce slightly some of the nutrition available to macaques, but it has not had a significant native effect on macaque populations. So in this one case of Bali, because of this complex religious, traditional, ecological frame, the macaques point of view is that this works. It works very well for them. Let me give you one other very surprising example. Most of you probably know about Singapore. Some of you may have been there. The last thing you're going to think about Singapore, which is one of the densest, most sort of high falutin uh, techno uh, urban landscapes on the planet, is that there's a ton of monkeys there. And there are. There are between about 1,500 and 2,000, maybe about 2,200 macaques living there, including uh, and also a number of snakes, wild pigs, binturong, and a variety of other uh, uh, tropical rainforest uh, animals. The macaques do quite well in Singapore, Living in and around the urban landscape, Singapore has a lot of sort of freestanding rainforest um, that is completely abutting and surrounded by or intermixed in urban landscapes. 70% of the macaque population is habituated to humans. About 50% obtains food source from humans. That means 50% actually obtain food um, from the forest patches within this incredibly dense urban environment. Um, so what you can see is the vast majority of macaque groups and populations live in and around these sort of large forested areas, but they do, they are found around uh, the entirety of Singapore, which is one of the densest, most developed human places on the planet. Now, how do they do this? This is very interesting. Uh, a number of colleagues and I, along with the Singapore uh, National Parks Board, uh, spent many years uh, basically GPS collaring and actually uh, uh, collaring with cameras as well, um, a number of G uh, macaques, and we found that they radically modify their behavioral and ranging profiles, not just dependent on sort of forest, but urban landscape, but on a daily basis, depending on bus routes, depending on trash routes, depending on school days, depending on weekends, depending on the human calendar. Macaque monkeys have modified their eco-dynamic to the Singaporean system. And they are coexistent in high frequency relatively with one of the densest places on the planet. Now, this does lead to conflicts <laughs> quite often. It's not to say there aren't conflicts, but the Singaporean government has intentionally structured, in a very Singaporean way, a, a very semi-totalitarian engagement with uh, fines and legal structuring around the maintenance of wildlife and interactions. Very different from the system in Bali, but from the macaque's perspective, a human dynamic, a legal, political, economic, structural dynamic that facilitates their existence in a fairly sustainable and robust way. So these are two examples, right, for Macaca fascicularis, um, and that's a, a very, I think, two very positive examples um, throughout this area. However, I'm going to have to lean back in on despair here briefly uh, for everyone, and that is um, the Long Tail Macaque Project um, has been working with uh, uh, researchers in uh, many of the home countries to uh, Macaca fascicularis and over the last uh, multiple years has done good assessments of population numbers and viability. Uh, and the depressing reality is that uh, the IUCN recently, uh, on our suggestion, reclassified macaques as um, endangered. Um, we know now that in the last 20 to 30 years, they've lost 40% of their existing population. And our prediction is in the next 20 to 30 years, they will lose 50% more. The United States alone imports 100 to 120,000 long-term macaques annually. Uh, from Southeast Asia primarily, uh, and, and, and Mauritius. Um, and uh, uh, probably as much as 20% of those have come from wild-caught populations. So the extraction of wild individuals around just medical testing uh, is probably numbering at a 20, 30, 40,000 annually. Um, we don't know how many are left. So little hope, still some despair. So, now I want to get to where I think the most hope lies and where my colleagues and I have demonstrated absolutely and unequivocally, if you're really a primate, you want to collaborate with indigenous communities around the planet. There's a very strong reason for that. It turns out that if you look, as we did over the last five years and just published uh, last month in Science Advances, if you look at distributions, for example, of IUCN status, that is uh, um, data deficient, least concerned, uh, non-threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critical, uh, and 
their overlap of primate populations with indigenous managed lands, you will find the only places primates are increasing really are in indigenous managed lands. And those that overlap mostly with indigenous managed lands are doing better, or at least stable. This is incredibly important when you look at the global distribution of indigenous managed lands and the distribution of primates. And what you will find is that in the, Afro, in the uh, Indo-Malayan tropics uh, and the Afrotropics and globally, um, the indigenous lands make up a larger percentage of primate ranges than do um, uh, national uh, lands. And the Neotropics is a special case where you've had radical reduction in indigenous managed lands. Um, and we can talk about the definition of indigenous and how we measure these things. I think this is extremely important because we know why this is happening, right? Um, this is happening because of the particular parameters of indigenous people's knowledge across the planet. And this is, let me be very clear, not to say that there's one form of indigenous knowledge or one group of people we call indigenous. There are many, 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 many indigenous peoples. But when we compared a deep dive into the data across indigenous managed lands, across the Americas, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Indo-Malayan region, we found that ubiquitously, the only places primates were doing well was on indigenous managed lands. Um, and what we found specifically, and I don't want to read this because it's important, is that given the range of 71% of primate species intersect indigenous people's lands, we will only avert mass extinctions of primates if we respect and support biocultural diversity and the efforts of indigenous peoples to maintain their languages and cultural symbolic ties to their lands and waters. This is, again, not some kind of uniform statement about indigenous lands, except that something is going on in these ecosystem management strategies that, from the primates' perspective, are much better than other lands. Right? And I'm not making this up. And I encourage everyone to go and look at the enormous amount of data that we've collected in the supplemental materials uh, to this article just to show how we've gone through, how we've calculated, how we've modeled these different things. Obviously, there's more data to be acquired. But when we began to look more than eight or nine years ago at primate extinctions, we did not know it was going to lead us to indigenous managed lands. This was a byproduct of a data exploration that drove us to these incredible series of details where we looked at sustainable land use, hunting, habitat conversion, geographical overlap, land dispossession, and primate conservation processes. And the bottom line, in every case, from the primates' perspective, right, looking not at humans, but actually asking, how are the primates doing? What's their eco-health? What are the patterns and processes? In every case, it was indigenous managed lands that showed positive impacts relative to almost all the other contexts. So as we try to mitigate the extens existential challenges uh, of the Anthropocene, climate change, large-scale environmental modifications, and mass extinctions, there's actually we found a relatively direct and highly effective way to sequester carbon. Uh, indigenous, manage, uh, indigenous peoples make up about 6% of the global population of humans. And indigenous managed lands make up about 24% of the sequestered carbon. There's a highly effective and relatively direct way to sequester carbon, restore natural resources, and safeguard primate biodiversity. That way is for national governments, international organizations, global citizens to support indigenous peoples in their efforts to continue stewardship of the lands, cultural, oral traditions, and treaties in place. Um, we know how this happens, and we know that the harms to indigenous peoples' lands and to those primates overlap with the harms that I've been highlighting this entire time. Um, this is not rocket science, uh, but there's an enormous amount of data to support it. So our argument is, in a nutshell, rather than investing or in addition to the traditional approach of investing in uh, particular kinds of conservation management and ecological studies, we know right now that if we support and enforce established legislation to protect indigenous people's land rights, protect indigenous people's traditional knowledge systems, language, culture, and establish social economic measures and policies to ensure indigenous people's welfare, that will have an immediate impact on primate conservation. All the other stuff is exploration. This we now could argue, we argue in this paper, and you can disagree, uh, we know. OK. Let me be very, very clear. This is not a noble, savage argument. This is not some sort of argument from this perspective like, oh, you know, indigenous peoples are better than other peoples. This is a straight up scientific argument based on the data we collected. And I think that's an important clarification. 
when you ask other primates, that is, when you look at the eco-health, population health and demography of other primates, and you see that those data suggest that a collaboration with particular kinds of humans is highly beneficial to them, that gives you a set of potential actions. All right, so here's my punchline, right? The Anthropocene is highly inequitable, and we need to center that discourse in our engagement with Anthropocenic crises. Second, there is an enormous amount of despair. All of you guys know Freya, right? Um, we are modifying the global climate in ways that drive other animals into conflict with humans in ways. And then we're frequently, when they find, when these refugees of the Anthropocene engage with us, we frequently kill them. And here I'm saying we, as in those communities, like here, right, who's contributing excessively to these climate, climate uh, and global impacts. There are beacons of hope in different relations between, for example, long-tailed macaques and humans throughout Southeast Asia that we can look to, not replicate, not export, but understand and support. And, and I think this is, I, I would hope, the most important punchline, we have found a data-rich solution, at least a temporary one, that is enactable at this moment. One can support global indigenous attempts to maintain their knowledges, their nationhoods, their sovereign rights, and force, or at least try to force governments, academic institutions, and conservation organizations to respect those and point their money in those directions. I'd like to call everyone's attention to the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. I mean, it is funded by Sting, but it's actually a very good uh, organization of folks. Um, and uh, the new project launching here uh, with Joao Bill, uh, Carlos Fausto, myself, and others and through the Brazil Lab, the Indigenous Ecologies of Knowledge, where we're trying to do small steps in contributing to these kinds of contexts. Bottom line is the Anthropocene is incredibly inequitable, and I think we need to front and center that perspective and ask multi-species questions and put ourselves in the shoes of other species, even if just for a little while, to get a better understanding of what we can do right now that might be effective not necessarily in ameliorating, but at least halting some of the devastation and despair. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and uh, we have, I have the computer here in front of me, so I'll be able to see questions from the Zoom world, and uh, I want to know if we have questions from the real world. And what I'd invite is, uh, you know, this has happened in, in other places. I wonder if some of our students or postdocs would like to start out with the first question. Uh, I'd, I'd ask our, our faculty to hold off for a second just to see if we can get some of our, our earlier. No students jumping at the chance here. We want to listen to you. There we go. Oh, sorry. Perfect. Right. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I, I really enjoyed it. As someone who does work in multi-species studies, um, it's really refreshing to see someone, you know, speaking to it. Um, I, had, I guess I had two questions for you. The first, I was wondering. This kind of gets into discussions about indigenous. Um, theoretical contributions to multi-species studies as a as a project, and I was wondering, you know, how you kind of are thinking about that here. I appreciate that you started with Kyle White um, and used his work at, to frame this kind of discussion, but I know that there are other people who do not, you know, uh, take nod to or engage indigenous practices um, and philosophies in their work as they're dealing with multi-species studies um, and scholarship. And the other one, the other question is more general. I was just curious if you give us a sense of some of the relationships. Um, you know, the actual, relate, like on the ground relationships that are emerging between long-tailed macaques um, and these, these people who you're working with and yeah, yeah. So, thanks. Uh, just really, really briefly, um, I, I encourage folks maybe to read the uh, uh, recent article by Kim Talbert, um, uh, Why Indigenous, Why Multi-Species Studies Needs Indigenous Perspectives. I think that outlines uh, some of the major thinkers uh, and some of the, the sort of impacts there. And, and I think if you pay attention to sort of the larger conservation discourse, you'll see there are a number of, of indigenous activists that are pushing um, and loudly and vocally sort of uh, for a space at the table of these academic endeavors. Um, we had uh, the last uh, semester here, the uh, uh, leap, Amazon, leapfrogging Amazon conference, uh, which really was a good example of how to sort of um, uh, 
reduce some of the inequity in voice and presence um, for indigenous scholars and activists in the academic context. And I think there's a long way to go, but I think we need to expand our philosophical, methodological, and practical sort of training to include a more diverse array of scholars, especially like if you're interested in primates and it turns out that some people are doing it well um, and we're not including them at the table at the funding and methodological training context. Um, so I think that's it. Um, the relationships, I, the, the picture on the poster and the picture uh, that, that I showed, one of the pictures I showed of uh, Ubu Wayan, this uh, older woman in South Bali with this young male. Uh, just to show you, for example, um, this, this group lives up on the top of a hill, this group of macaques, um, where a temple is. And they come down uh, to the road where she has a little water and a little uh, shop. Um, and they cross the road and then go raid crops in the village and all of that. This young male, since he was probably three or four years old, fairly young, uh, would stop and walk over to the warung and um, she would give him a little food. And the two of them, for years, uh, he's, he's dead now, um, of old age, um, for years the two of them would sit together and, and just share a little time. And I think what we see across uh, the range of long-tail macaques and humans is there are a number of ways in which macaques and humans co provide for one another in these different kinds of ecological spaces. This is not to deny they also conflict all the time and have all sorts of problems, but they, they, they present something to each other culturally and emotionally, socially, which is very important. And um, fortunately, unfortunately, path, they, they share pathogens nonstop. Um, and this is very dangerous for the macaques, I think, in this context. Um, but it is also interesting for our understanding of modeling of viral transmission uh, across Southeast Asia, an area that obviously we should be paying more attention to. Um, yeah, so those are a couple examples. Okay, do we have other questions? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, ow, ow. Thank you. Um, I'm a junior in the EEB department undergrad, um, and I was wondering if in your research you found um, if long term macaws have promoted ecological recovery from polluted spaces? So I think that's a, that's a very challenging question, right? Because in, in most cases, long-tail macaques prefer peri-urban or peri-anthrome uh, perspectives. They love to live in around, like one of our studies, we live, why don't they live in the forest in Bali? Well, it turns out even those few groups that ranged primarily in the forest, they would come sleep on the edge of villages. Um, and so they, they, long tail macaques are consistently in and around human uh, environments. And so what long tail macaques are a good uh, indication of is the robusticity or the diversity of dietary possibilities in those uh, uh, edge environments around human communities. Um, and so that's what they might be telling us. They don't really tell us much, I think, about uh, sort of dense or tro primary forest environments, because that's not where they spend any time. But I find this very interesting because the fi primary forest environments are not the majority of forests anymore. And it is these edge environments that are actually very important. And so what they might be telling us is the health of these edge environments. In Bali, for example, you have all of these small forest patches and these riparian forest uh, patches that support not only um, the macaques, but a number of other bird and mammalian species. And so what they might be showing us is possible ways of sustainable resource use that isn't this sort of traditional forest conservation mode, but rather this sort of heavily human manipulated, but still successful environment for other species. So great, is it, and now we can open up to everybody questions, but here. And uh, here, there's that uh, pink shirt or red or I. Uh, and then um, oh. What we have here first, and then there. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, maybe for primates specifically, but then also I'm I'm thinking more about um, mammals in in general. Um, but in in your opinion, what are the characteristics that are important? potential predictors for which species are gonna survive the Anthropocene or like, or, or be able to adapt to human made landscapes and, and potentially have these uh, new relationships with humans. Um, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot, of, as you know, there's a lot of research on, you know, how do we predict which species can survive uh, contemporary anthropogenic uh, alterations and contexts. So I cheated a little bit 
because macaques and humans have very similar physiology and digestive systems, and so they can overlap a lot just in that ecotype, in that sort of structural context. Um, but what I find more interesting is that a lot of these predictors about generalists or particularly flexible digestive systems or social behavioral types, which indicate who can live well with humans, um, what we find on these indigenous managed lands is that it's not just those. It's actually a much broader array. Of, of, of animals uh, and plants. Um, and so what I think we have, particularly in these indigenous managed lands, at least to the ability that we have the data to assess it, much more data are needed, is that there's something about relational management strategies across the Americas, Africa, and the Indo-Malayan region by many indigenous groups that is enabling not just those hypergeneralists to do well around humans. Um, and so I think, I think learning what that might be, I think is really important. And the way we found probably the most important way to learn what that might be was one, support those management strategies right now. And two, listen to the people who are doing it and let them tell you what they're doing as opposed to telling them what they should be doing. And we have another question on the left side of the room and then. Yeah, um, this was a really powerful and fascinating talk. And I, I wanted to ask about the first Right. Where you're talking about inequality, yeah. global inequality of both the production of emissions and the effects of emissions. Um, because it seems like there's a there's a tension that I'm not sure how to, to square, which is that it's precisely in a place like Indonesia, where there are multiple claims about inequality that go in directly opposition. Right. Direction. So just as you have these indigenous knowledge systems in Bali, you have in, in Java uh, new coal fired plants, new forms of extraction on the basis of green low carbon right. development, all being done in the name of reducing the inequalities right. that have dis, that have disproportionately affected countries right. like Indonesia. So how do you how do you think about that tension and the kinds of conclusions that you yeah, I think that's really important, and I just gave a very superficial one, but let me just repeat the question. Is this, there's this conflict between saying, oh, well, it's the global north versus the global south, and this kind of suffering versus impact, uh, contribution versus suffering. Um, you're right, that's hyper-simplistic. I think Indonesia is a great example, right? We've got this sort of sustainability complex in Bali, likely, but in Java, we have the reverse of that, right? Java is not a sustainable ecosystem. Uh, at this point in, in many, many different ways. And so what I think is very important is, uh, so for example, that paper that I showed you from uh, Richard Marcantonio, Deborah Javelin, and myself, we tried to scale a bunch of this sort of contribution to climates, toxic pollution, suffering of that, but also scale it by economic, political, and historical processes. And what you do is then you complexify that stratification, right? And you find places like Indonesia is not the right category, because Java and Bali and Sulawesi are really different in that standing and that structure. Um, and so what, what I would argue is that we need a much more particulate sort of, when we talk about inequity, I was also giving you the general thing, but if I was talking just about the inequities, I in fact would have used that example. Um, Java and Bali uh, have a very interesting history, but have taken very divergent paths in this sort of context. And that is related to not just the colonial moment, but also the contemporary capital and economic moment in the sort of geopolitical and geoeconomic processes. Um, and so I think we can create much more um, refined and dynamic scales of inequity. And, and I think that's where we should also be looking. I think that's very important. And I think thinking through primates can help us do that, right? Primates are suffering horribly and just going extinct like crazy in, in Java. They're not in Bali. They're not in Sulawesi. And, and there's reasons that are associated with the things that we, I just mentioned that are associated with that. So I think there are some mammalian and bird species that help us sort of try to identify which places should we dive down into more, with more detail into these kinds of inequities. Okay, we have actually two questions uh, that came online that tie into this question to some degree, and I'll give them to you both. See if you can have, the first question, I'm gonna paraphrase here, it asks about the definition of indigenous people, particularly in contexts that don't correspond to the settled and colonial experience of the Americas. For instance, in Indonesia, who's indigenous, who is not? And then relatedly, um, what do you think the indigenous uh, group's cultural characteristics uh, are that allow for coexistence with multiple species? We, you've been very clear that, that yeah. indigenous people is not a catch, you know, simple Absolutely. term. So what, what is the mechanism there? 
All right, so let me point out that we use two. This definition of indigenous peoples is highly problematic in many parts of the world, and so we decided to go with the International Labor Organization Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention of 1989 for the official uh, definition. Um, people can look this up if you want, but it's basically tribal peoples and independent countries whose social, cultural, and economic conditions <coughs> distinguish them from other sections of the national community and whose status is regulated wholly or partially by their customs or traditions or by special laws or regulations. And then it goes on to outline that. We also uh, encourage people to look at the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and there's a similar definition there. Um, but we, with all of the different indigenous communities that we work with, we asked across different continental areas, what here are the definitions, how do you define yourself, how should we talk with this, and, and we landed on this definition. There are many, many holes in that definition. In the paper we go talk a lot about Madagascar, uh, which the, all of the traditional groups do not fall under that definition uh, because of the recency and, and a variety of other complexities, but we consider them uh, we think they, they also fit into this category. So, um, and also, for example, in Brazil, we also have what we call traditional communities, right, which are not indigenous communities, but are, are doing many of the same things. And so I think there's a lot of complexity there, but when, when defaulting, we go to what the International Organization of Indigenous Peoples have asked us to use. And so there are, are definitions. Uh, on the second question, uh, I think this is very important. Um, we, I don't know. I think many indigenous groups in different areas have a good idea of what they're doing that works. Um, and I think one of the tragedies of, and this is, you know, I've been working in conservation sciences for 20 something years. Um, it's really on the last decade that, that I began seriously in my professional work to, to ask local populations seriously how they're engaging these things and then to try to theorize that academically rather than just sort of ethnographically report it. Um, and I think it's that translation to theorizing and, and, and engaging wholly as an, as, as an intellectual equal in how we conceptualize these projects that, that makes the difference. And I think that's, that's the next stage. But like, what is it? So our data sets, and you can go and look in some of the general things, uh, it's varied. Indigenous peoples manage their landscapes in many, many different ways. But I think, I'll drop back to Kyle White in his frame there, we think it's differential processes of relation and different perceptions of those relations that structure different ecological and structural dynamics of behavior that maybe facilitate different kinds of perceptions of the world that lead to different ecological engagements. That, that's a very philosophical way of framing that, but I think on the ground research and collaboration is gonna get us at better understandings. But at this point, we say very clearly, we don't know, like we can't pull out the three things that work. What we do know is that our data assessment clearly demonstrates that indigenous managed lands are the only places where primates are doing okay. So our suggestion is, since we know that and we don't know, understand yet, let's just put a bunch of money and political effort into those populations and their sovereignty to let them do what they're doing while we try to figure it out. Well, thank you. Let's uh, join me in, in thanking Agustin again. And uh, I will, uh, we've, this is our second uh, faculty seminar of the semester. Join me and join all of us in November 1st, where uh, Jessica Metcalf, Professor Jessica Metcalf of SPIA and uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, will be discussing uh, disease in motion and landscapes of health. So uh, we talked about pathogens here, and we will continue on that theme. Uh, thank you, and see you again.